Why do I do it? Why am I still in it? We are doing things that nobody else does. Entertainment is fine. The basketball, the funny antics that we do. But there are people that have never seen the Trotters, and every day that I pass through an arena and a game, I meet one. And every time I hear that, it gives me a more uh, purpose, it gives me a grind that I want to keep going and churning and hear the next story after the next story after the next story. I was the dribbler like Curly Neal and the great Marcus Haynes and all the others that, that were before him and them. Uh, I was a show dribbler is what they call it. It's a lot of practice, a lot of work. Practice every day and because basketball, it's a funny sport. It's, it's, it's almost, it's, it's an extension to yourself. I don't remember a time where I just actually didn't play basketball. 24-7 uh, was... <laughs> You know, either I had a basketball with me dribbling it down the street, uh, sidewalks, rather, or I was at a hard court just shooting around. Decided to go to junior college. The best choice I could have made, and I'm glad I did. I graduated in two years. I was able to have enough credits to attend the, and to go, go, go to the major university because I was an advanced junior, basically. So uh, my two years at Tyler Junior College, two national, appearances to national, junior college national appearances, and uh, I had a great career there. Maybe I had 30, 35 offers, maybe, from all over the nation, and um, I wanted to go to Michigan State, and when I went to visit, it was just too cold. Texas wasn't anywhere on my radar at the time, um, but they made a visit to the school, and behind closed doors, they were talking to my coach, Floyd Wagstaff and Coach Black's assistants at the time. Long story short, I signed up to come to the University of Texas. I think I went into a shell, so to speak, you know, uh, for a minute. And um, being the first African American scholarship player, student athlete, I was, uh, I kind of closed myself off a little bit because I didn't know where I fit in. It took me a while uh, to uh, gravitate to the kind of uh, situation I was being put, my, uh, been put in. So uh, it, was, uh, it was a daunting experience in the beginning. As time went on, things got rocky and rough, of course, uh, and, but I won't go into all that because I made it through. I made it out, you know, and I'm thankful. And if I had to do it all over again, I would do it the same way, but just with a little bit more knowledge. I was in the Washington Bullets camp and um, I nearly signed a contract. I got turned around, my mother passed away. I had some younger brothers at home that needed care. Right before trying to sign this contract with the Bullets, the Trotters, Globe Trotters contacted me and there was a gentleman by the name of Tex Harrison, who then became, later on became my mentor and um, he was pursuing me quite heavily and I was pushing him back because I couldn't do that stuff. So I told him, Mrs. so why are you suing me, I can't do this. I'm just a basketball player, that's all I know how to do. And he says, oh, I can teach you everything you need to know. I said, well, why me though? Why you want me, you know? He says, oh, something special about you. Other than playing basketball, I couldn't see anything special about me, to be honest with you. So uh, he pursued me and um, I wound up becoming a, a glove driver. And I don't know why, I, I'm being honest with you, I don't know why, it could have been a thousand other guys. I went to camp with Danny players. A basketball club, that's crazy. 90, 90, 9 zero players. And I was the shortest guy in camp. I was 6'1". The next tallest guy was 6'5". They went up to seven foot two inches tall. And when I got to camp, I'm scratching my head and saying, I'm going home. This doesn't make sense at all. I didn't talk much, I was a very quiet guy. And they forced me into saying, it. well, this, is, was, this was a force. Either you do it or you're not here next year. You see what I'm saying? So that's what they wanted in me. They wanted me to be a part of this. And they wanted me in areas where I didn't want to be. I felt uncomfortable. But for me, I had to um, start talking. And I think once I started, they couldn't stop me. So I wound up being in all of these commercials. Really a ball when you're picking up the chicken.
looking at it at all. And all these shows and, and movies, and uh, it was is probably one of the greatest things that could have happened. I think that if I would just uh, close and shut myself up or down, um, I wouldn't be sitting here today. Probably not. No, I'm sure I wouldn't be. This is my ninth year back as a coach. I don't have a discouraging word in my heart. It's just been beautiful. It's healing for a lot of people. And I say that with great respect because we have a lot of fans that come to these games and tell me, you don't know what this meant to me. I was down, I was out, I didn't have, I was sad, I'm divorced, I just got out of uh, cancer treatments, I'm, I'm in remission. It's healing. The young lady, 93 years old, was at the game the other day and her last wishes was to see a Harlem Globetrotters game. Had a young kid, was 12 years old, four months ago. His wish was to see the Globetrotters before he died. There was a storm, snowstorm, and he couldn't make it, and he died that night. healing. It even healed me. So. I was honored here in 2016 uh, and to come back and being honored by the greatest living sports team in the world. Man. My emotions are all over the place, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that I'm just falling apart. <laughs> I'm telling the truth. All of you, all of us, will have a legacy in our lives, whether we like it or not. The problem is, which is your legacy? And who are your legacy? I can truly stand here today and say, This is my legacy.